Good morning, everyone. You are very welcome this morning, starting to be in your church. Sorry, I'm a bit tired after yesterday. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm the youth pastor here at Darlington Vineyard Church. Uh, whether you are in the room here or watching online now or later, you're very welcome to our service this morning. The order of service today, we're going to have some sung worship led by the amazing worship band behind me this morning. Uh, after that, we're going to have uh, a time where we're going to let you know about what's happening in the life of the church with some notices. And then we're going to go into a five-minute break where the kids will go out for kids' ministry and we'll tell you a bit more about what's going to happen with that in a little bit. And then we're going to have the amazing Tabby, who's speaking to us today, as we continue our series in Nehemiah. After that, we'll have some time to respond to the message, and there'll be some time for prayer as well. Uh, If kids are in the room and they're a bit sensitive with the ears, there are some ear defenders at the back, uh, if you want to put them on as we go into worship. So, I'll pray for us, and then we'll worship. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have to come together this morning to worship to hear your word, to be here as a community together. I just really pray that we um, open ourselves up to you this morning. However we come here this morning, whether we're tired, whether we're ready to go, feeling alive for you, uh, whether there's things on our minds, whatever it is, Lord, just pray we come and give our all to you this morning and overflow with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Amen. So, um, shall we stand? Just as we were praying this morning, um, I had the Psalm 139 in my heart, and it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know, when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too powerful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your, from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shore, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and, I, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall, shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is light with you. For you formed my inner parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when it was, when it was being made in secret, intric- intricately woven in the depths of the earth. You, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Father, thank you for knowing our hearts, Lord God. Father, you are, you are so, so good to us, Lord God, and we praise you, and we worship your name, and we lift you high. We lift you high up, Father. Without you, we're nothing, Lord Jesus. And you have made us, you have fearfully uh, made us wonderful, wonderful in your eyes, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Try to know. Stranger to your 
came as a savior with the power to set me free. You came as a father for the prodigal in me. Well, I was still far away. You came with a
you left the 99 to go after the one, Father. There is nowhere we can go, there is nowhere we can run, there is nowhere we can hide, Lord God, but you won't find us. grace and mercy and power and joy and love covers us, Father, and just protects us from anything that's not from you, Lord. Thank you for always coming after us and running after us, Father. Before us and beside us, you're always there.
so <laughs> Welcome to Darlington Vineyard Church. We are excited you're here this morning. And if you are visiting us for the first time, you are very welcome. So in a moment, the offering basket is going to make its way around. Uh, we are a church that believes that we honour God by giving the first of our income, with 10% being a good starting point for putting God first in our finances. If you'd like the opportunity to give, but don't yet, you can visit darlo.church forward slash give for all the information on doing so. Giving has enabled us to extend the kingdom here in Darlington and beyond and to continue our mission of inviting people into a radical life of faith to impact the world through Darlington. And so we want to say thank you for following God's leading in what you already give. Uh, if you're visiting here, don't feel that you have to give anything. You can just let it go by. But please just help yourself to the sweets that are coming around as well. Mm. Many of you will give in other ways through serving, and many choose to give an offering on top of the tithe digitally. So please let the basket go by if that's how you choose to give. So few things about the life of the church. Um, at the back of the table there, there is a welcome table. Everything on there is free. There's some great books, there's leaflets, there's all sorts of resources for engaging in some stuff um, within the church and from the things that we bring in. Um, if you're new or don't receive church communications, do please fill in one of these forms. Uh, he's got some details on the back for you to fill in and that's how we can keep in touch with you about all that's going on within the church. And the small groups aren't meeting through the month of August. It's just a break through the month of August. That's right. We'll start again in September. Um, baptisms. So last Saturday, we had the joy of going to Saltburn Beach last week uh, to baptize five people, which was amazing. Yay. So it was such a joy. If you weren't there, um, you didn't get drenched, so good on you. But there's also a video uh, that has been made lovingly, so we can watch and watch some highlights together. I see horizons in your eyes where all creation came alive. You made it all. You made it all. You spin the planets round the sun. You fit the pieces one by one. You know it all. cool was that? Super cool. Oh, we've got double audio. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> um, where are we? Oh, here we go. So at the end of August, we have our church retreat. I'm very excited about it. So it's going to be in Wydale. It's an hour and 40 minutes away towards Cabra. So it will be a great chance to go to a very beautiful place to enjoy and being, uh, being together. Um, all food is included, so we don't need um, to have a catering team, teams. Um, if you haven't signed up yet and would like to, all the information is on dalil.church slash forward forward slash links. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Just a notice as well about youth tonight. So it's a little bit different. We're going to meet at the same place. We'll meet at the cafe again at five o'clock. But we are going to then travel to Eagles Cliff, to All Saints Church, for a gathering called Refresh. And that is a Teesside-wide gathering of all the youth groups that want to come from Teesside. So it'll be a great chance to meet other people who are the same age as you um, 
and connect and worship and pray together, uh, all together as, um, as like a borough of Teesside, which would be awesome. So the plan is we're going to aim to get back for 9 p.m. So parents, if you would like to be at a cafe at 9 o'clock, that would be awesome to collect your children. Uh, and we'll keep in touch throughout uh, as we go on what the plan is for getting back. Um, if you're not aware of this and want to find out more info, just come and chat to me or give me a message uh, and we'll give you more information. And finally, so the reason why uh, Tabby and I are pretty tired today is because we ran a tough muddy yesterday. Um, do you want to come up, Tabby? <laughs> do you want to explain a bit about what happened? Yeah, so the weather was not on our side. Um, it was very heavy rain and a bit of hail too. Um, but somehow still managed to get sunburnt, which I'm not quite sure how we managed that. Um, we did a 5k Tough Mudder with 15, 16 obstacles. They added in a surprise one out on the day. Um, and um, as you can see, got very wet, very muddy, and very cold in Sam's case. <laughs> That is very accurate. <laughs> it pretty much sums up the day, doesn't it? Um, but we actually had a really good time, cheered on by our incredible team of people who came down with us and literally screamed encouragement the entire way around. And probably walked 5K themselves, actually, from following us with the cameras. <laughs> it was brilliant. It was, it was great fun, in amongst all of the, the dampness and the pain, but it was really good fun. Um, we have unbelievably raised from people's generosity uh, about £2,000, which is so cool. So that's all going towards, so from what we've done from running and from people giving to D for Roscoe's DTI, we just want to say thank you so much for all that you've given and all the provision that you've given us generously to be able to take children that couldn't afford to come to DTI to have tickets to then go and experience that week that's happening in a couple of weeks. Um, it's going to help pay for food, transport, stuff whilst we're there. So, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's also not too late to give, if you'd like to already, now that you've seen our pain and suffering. Uh, the link for giving uh, is uh, it's at chipondollar.church slash links or just come and chat to us and we'll give you a link. Um, I think we're going to yep. move into something now. So in a few minutes, not in a few minutes, in a few seconds, we're <laughs> going to go uh, to our five-minute break. And please, uh, if you brought your kids with you and you want to um, assign them to the kids' ministry, please take them to the kids' ministry. Make sure you sign them in and get the stickers so you can get the ki your kid back at the end of uh, the kids' ministry. <laughs> 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 they don't want to keep them. <laughs> Brilliant. Back okay. in five. Yeah.
place We believe your goodness We receive your grace We delight ourselves At your table, O oh God You do all things well Just look at our lives We can feel the love Of God in this place We believe your goodness We receive your grace We delight ourselves At your table, O oh God You do all things well Just look at to bring the word of the Lord to us. So let's pray for her. Lord, we um, just thank you so much for Tabby's life. Lord, we thank you for the words you have um, put in her heart. Lord, and as she shares everything that you uh, encourage her as she prepared this message, Lord, may your word encourage us all here this morning and to be uh, just lift us all, Lord, and may we leave this place um, exciting about being involved in the work you're doing in us and through us. And um, may Tabby be more and more inspired. Thank you for everything that she does here in our church. We pray a blessing upon her life. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you. So, as Elisa just said, I'm Tabby. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the youth leaders in the church. And before we get into it this morning, as you've just heard, we did a Tough Mudder, so if I'm a bit stiff or you see any patches of dirt or any bruises, um, give me a bit of grace about that. Um, so, if, as some of you may know, um, we've been going for about the last two and a half months through a series following the absolutely incredible story of the book of Nehemiah. And today is the penultimate week of our series. If you've only just joined us this week, or you've missed some weeks recently and you want to catch up, or if you've seen every week but you're so excited and amazed by the story that you want to listen through the whole thing again, it's all on darlow.church forward slash watch again. So to briefly recap, in the first half of the series, we heard about the physical restoration of the wall of Jerusalem. We heard about the struggles faced by Nehemiah personally and the ones faced by the people of Israel more generally as they tried to physically restore their city after a long period in exile with many people being sold into slavery under the Babylonians. In the second half of the series, we've then been hearing about the restoration of the people themselves as they rebuilt their community in their newly restored city. We heard about how they gathered to hear the law and had it explained to them, leading to many of them understanding it for the very first time, and a realisation amongst the people of how far from that law and from God they had grown. This led to the people confessing their sins before God and taking the time to recommit their covenant with God. We heard last week from Lisa about how, for some amongst them, leaning into this new life of renewed relationship with God meant laying down their lives, their homes, their professions, and moving to occupy the newly rebuilt city that actually inside of the wall was still pretty inhospitable and help with its ongoing restoration. And I think to summarise this more succinctly, we should consider it like this. In the first half of the series, we hear about how the physical wall surrounding the city was rebuilt. And then in the latter half, we're being told about how the people have started to tear down the spiritual wall that they had formed between themselves and God over many decades of straying away from him. So today, we're going to continue to think about that spiritual reawakening as we look at the penultimate chapter, where we hear about the 
dedication of the newly completed wall. As both Dylan and Lisa have noted in the past two weeks, these final chapters of Nehemiah have really, really quite a lot of names to start them. Very hard to pronounce names. In this particular chapter, names make up the first 26 verses, so not quite as much as Dylan had a couple of weeks ago, but not far off. But as he highlighted then, the names are important. God doesn't include anything in the scripture without a good reason. And I'm not going to read them all to you because I'm looking to give a comprehensible preach this morning, and I'm too dyslexic to put myself through that with a microphone on my face. Um, So instead, I'm going to summarize. Um, In total, more than 30 leaders amongst the priests and Levites are mentioned by name. It starts first with a description of the priests who first returned to Jerusalem at the beginning of the return from exile. Then it explains the priests and Levites at the time of the dedication and their genealogy and their connection to their forefathers. This is important not only because God cares about each individual to mention them by name, as Dylan said two weeks ago, but also because to the Jewish community at this time, genealogy was crucial. The promises of God were inherited by the people of Israel, passed down generation to generation, and the coming into fruition of the promises he had made to them was verified using these genealogies all the way through the scripture, all the way through the generations, culminating in the ability of the Jewish community to recognize Jesus as Messiah. Thus, by emphasizing the genealogy of the leaders amongst the priests and Levites, what Nehemiah is doing is highlighting all the promises that God had made and kept within his people and letting us know why these particular priests and Levites were the leaders of their time. Having cleared up who they are, let's read verses 27 to 43 about the dedication of the wall together now. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness and thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals, harps and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered around together from the district surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the Netophotites. Also from Beth Gilgal and from the region of Geber and Asmaveth. For the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem. And the priests and Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. And then I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went south on the wall to the dung gate, and after went to Hushiah and half of the leaders of Judah, and Azariah and Ezra, Meshullam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemahiah, and Jeremiah, and certain of the priests' sons with trumpets, Zechariah the son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Machiah, son of Zachar, son of Asaph, and his relatives, Shemaiah, Azarel, Melali, Gilali, Mai, Nathanael, Judah, and Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra the scribe went before them. At the fountain gate, they went up straight before them by the stairs of the city of David at the ascent of the wall above the house of David to the water gate on the east. The other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I followed them with half the people on the wall, above the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, and above the gate of Ephraim, and by the gate of Yeshana, and by the fish gate and the tower of Hananel, and the tower of the hundred, to the sheep gate. And they came to a halt at the gate of the guard. So both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God, and I and half of the officials with me, and the priests, Elikayim, Messiah, Minamayan, Micaiah, Elionai, Zechariah, and Hanani with trumpets, and Messiah, Shemaiah, Eliza, Uzi, Jehohanan, Malchijah, Elam, and Ezer. And the singers sang with Jezriah as their leader, and they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard from far away. Now, Reading through those passages, it's so clear that this was an exciting and amazing time for the people of Israel. They've restored their city, its wall, and now they're restoring their relationship with God. And that excitement is expressed in this chapter through worship. Verse 27 says, They sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, and with singing. That was the ultimate purpose of this gathering, to dedicate the wall to God and to celebrate that dedication by worshipping him. First and foremost, that worship is the focus of this chapter. It's about the people of this newly restored Jerusalem coming together to worship the God who brought them out of exile, who brought them back together as a people, and who enabled them against all odds and all the challenges faced to rebuild their city, a place that was their spiritual and cultural home. 
And it's amazing the scale and the spirit of what they do. It's completely awe-inspiring. Lisa spoke last week about what an amazing film could be made out of this book. And wow, what an incredible scene this chapter would make. You can picture it, can't you? Hundreds, if not thousands, of people processing across the newly restored walls of Jerusalem. The walls that in chapter 4 we heard someone say couldn't, one of the enemies of their state say couldn't support a fox walking along it. And now there's thousands of people processing along it, singing their praises to God. Hollywood would love it. So would the West End. It would make an excellent musical. <laughs> but beyond the spectacle and the amazing image this chapter paints in our minds, when I was preparing for this week and reading into the scripture, a few more specific things about the way the, they worship were drawn to my attention that I think are really important for us today. The first is that the description starts before the main ceremony begins. In verse 30, it says, And the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. The Levites, people who were dedicating their whole lives to serving God, purified themselves and everything and everyone around them before they began their celebration. Now, what we don't get much clarification on is what that actually means. Did they pray? Did they make a sacrifice? We aren't told. But the principle is what is key. Before they begin worshipping God, they take time to prepare themselves to spend time praising him. And when I was reading this, it made me think, how often do I do this? How often do we do this? How often do we take the time to pause, clear our minds, and get ready for church, or for a small group, let alone for a private Bible study or some personal time in prayer? And a bit of a confession, but one that I don't think I'm alone in, I sometimes stand or sit in church with my mind wandering because I've rushed in in the morning to serve on a team or to make sure I get in time to get a coffee, or even just because the world is busy and our lives are busy. But that means that when I arrive, I'm distracted, and my heart is not fully on God because my mind is on other things. And maybe some of you can relate to that. It's often difficult to leave the outside world at home or in the car or at the door outside. Sometimes it's hard to 100% engage in God's presence and God's word. In Isaiah 29, verse 13, it says, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honour me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. In other words, he's saying that sometimes these people say and do all the right things, they're there in a service, but because they have been taught that it's the right thing to do by men, not because their heart is truly in it, truly with God. So, then I had to ask myself, what would it look like if we followed in the footsteps of the priests and the Levites that we hear about in this chapter? If before every bit of time we set aside to spend good time with God, we prepared our heart and our mind. We took the time to consciously sit and try and let go of the worries, the stresses, the fears of our secular lives and just prepared, purified ourselves to spend quality time with God, worshipping him, and making space for him to move. And that could be whether it's before a Sunday morning in church, or before a small group, or in our living room, or our car, before spending time in personal prayer, or listening to a podcast or worship music. Wherever you are, consciously putting aside time to spend with God. And for me, when I do do this, and I take that time to think about it, I find two things. First, I am able to engage more in what God is doing and speaking over my life. But secondly, I think it's easier to take that out into my week from that moment and into my life outside of church. So I just want to ask everyone to reflect for a second. Ask yourself, how often have you spent time sat in church on a Sunday morning and you're paying attention and the talk is incredible, but by Tuesday you couldn't explain the message that you heard or the learning that you gained from Sunday? or say what worship was like. Now, I understand we all have busy lives and everyone has things that happen in their week that sometimes mean that no matter how much they prepare their heart or listen closely or even take notes, they just aren't able to fully focus on that week's message or the wisdom that someone shares in a small group discussion or over a coffee. But I believe that by building into our lives a habit of taking a moment to ready our hearts before we meet with God we have the potential to bring our hearts closer to God and deepen our understanding of what he's doing in them and doing in our lives and then take that understanding forward into our communities and our homes. 
The next thing I want us to hone in on is the worship itself. I think most of us here this morning know how important spending time in worship is. Its importance in our lives and guidance on how we should worship is littered throughout the Bible. Hebrews 12, 28 to 29 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship, worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. 1 Chronicles 23, 30 to 31 says, And they were to stand every morning, thanking and praising the Lord, and likewise at evening, and whenever the burnt offerings were offered to the Lord, on Sabbaths, new moons, feast days, according to the number required of them, regularly before the Lord. Jeremiah 20, 13, Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. John 4, 23, 24, The hour is coming, and now is here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And also, even earlier in Nehemiah, in chapter 9, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of the heavens, and all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you as we just sung about in our final worship song this morning. And that's just a handful, a tiny handful of the dozens of mentions of worship in Scripture. In short, the Bible tells us that we should worship God just because that is what is right, because he is a glorious and generous God, the creator of all things, and raising him up in worship allows us to celebrate him and thank him for all he has done and will do for us. So that's our baseline. We know why they are doing it. But what I focus, want to focus, us to focus on this morning is how they're doing it. What I think is important to note about all of this worship in this dedication chapter is the mood. This wasn't a somber affair. Throughout the chapter, the joyous atmosphere is highlighted. Verse 27 says, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings and singing, with cymbals, harps and lyres. Then later, verse 43, it says, And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard from far away. They are worshipping with joy in their hearts. They are worshipping to give thanks and joyfully celebrate God and all that he has done for them. And it's clear from the end of the chapter that it's not just the priests or the Levites or the leaders who are celebrating in this way or taking part. It's all the people, the men, the women, the children. They are as a people coming together to wholeheartedly celebrate God and worship him with their hearts full of joy. Now, wholehearted and joyful worship is something that, by and large, I think we're pretty good at at Darlington Vineyard Church. Our worship team certainly models joyful worship on week on week as they lead us from the front, as we've just seen this morning. And more generally as a church, we don't often hold back when we're gathering, even when we're out in the middle of town or in a car park or in someone's living room or garden. But with that being said, sometimes completely letting go during worship is hard, right? As someone who came to faith as an adult, the first time I walked into a vineyard church and saw people at the front waving their arms in the air and throwing themselves on the floor, I thought, what on earth have I walked into? Um, my only experience of church growing up was an occasional school carol service, which mostly involved like, quite formal, kind of structured worship. And at first, that was quite intimidating to me. As someone who, contrary to popular belief, really hates being looked out or standing out in a crowd, particularly during worship, who had only recently found faith and was still exploring, I used to ch- stand in church on a Sunday morning and think, is this how you're meant to worship? Is that how I'm meant to be spending time with God? Is that what's expected of me by the people around me for them to feel like I'm truly connecting with him, with the worship? But of course, it isn't. Because God doesn't care about whether we're waving our arms in the air and clapping at the front of church, or whether we're sat quietly singing to ourselves in our own bedroom with no one else there. God cares what's in our hearts when we worship him. And when we really lean in to unbridled worship from the heart, not just as something that we do at the beginning of our Sunday service, but as a way of celebrating God with all of ourselves, whether we're dedicating a miraculous wall as the people of Israel were in this chapter, or celebrating a new building, meeting an entirely new environment or in a familiar place, whether we're gathered as a people or alone in our kitchen or our living room or our car, 
it's inherently joyful. For me, when I'm struggling with feeling anxious or frustrated or sad, when I've been going through something difficult at work or at home, in my family, worship has the power to fill my heart with joy in of itself, no matter what else is happening around me. And maybe you've had a similar experience where you've come in and something's just happening in your week and your mood has been changed, a bad day transformed, a bad week transformed by worshipping God. This happens because lifting your spirit to worship God aloud is an incredibly powerful thing. By worshipping God, we open our heart to him and step further and more consciously into his presence. And that alone can change your whole mood, your whole day. So I want to suggest that the next time you're feeling sad, frustrated, worried, whatever it is, put on your favourite worship song. Turn the volume as high as you can and find some time to worship God and sit in his presence. But beyond just the impact on your own spirit, worshipping God with joy is important for another reason too. And that is that your joy in worship has the ability to impact others. In this chapter, Nehemiah and Ezra form these huge congregations of Levites, priests, singers, musicians, and split in two. They walk either way around the newly rebuilt wall, singing and playing music and worshipping God until they meet at the temple. Imagine the scale and the power of that. They unabashedly and wholeheartedly just stand on top of the walls of their city and sing out in celebration of God. And as we hear at the end of the verse of 43 that we finished with, the joy of Jerusalem was heard from far away. This made me think back when I read it to April when a group of us went down to the Trent Vineyard um, National Leaders Gathering. And on the very first day, we opened with a time of worship. And it was amazing to see hundreds of people who serve the Lord in their lives by serving their churches and their communities all come together and just unabashedly worship God. You could feel the Holy Spirit moving. You could sense the joy and the excitement and the expectation in the room. And many of you may have been to similar events, conferences, Christian festivals like Dream the Impossible, where our youth group are going this summer. And if you have, then you know that when the people of God gather like this and celebrate him, that joy, that excitement is infectious to anyone in the room or the vicinity. And the worship at the dedication of the wall was likely many times bigger than most events that any of us might have been to today. We know from chapter 11 that there were almost 300 Levites just amongst those living in Jerusalem now. And this chapter tells us that more were brought back from the surrounding towns to join the celebration. So even just counting the Levites alone, we know that there are hundreds of people taking part in this celebration. But also present were the community leaders, the priests, the people themselves. The scale is massive. And with that in our minds, you can imagine it, can't you? People in their villages, in their towns, farmers in the fields surrounding Jerusalem, hearing the infectious sound of hundreds or even thousands of people singing out in complete unbridled joy and thankfulness, worshipping the God to whom that joy and thankfulness was owed. When we sing out our praises with joy, like these people did, we demonstrate to the wider world and the community that we live in what living a life in relationship with God looks like. It showcases to those around us who do not yet know God the type of true joy that comes only from knowing his love and his presence in our lives. Demonstrating God's love and the joy of living in active relationship with him through worship is one way that we reach the hearts of some of those who don't yet know him. And in many cases, it's a really good way of opening the conversation with them. People who would otherwise close off their minds and their hearts to him, even as he is pursuing them. It sometimes allows us to start that conversation when they feel the joy of listening to our worship. And perhaps some of you here, worship was what first drew you to church. Or perhaps it was the thing that reignited your faith after a difficult period. Or maybe, as is the case for myself, during sung worship was the first time that you felt the Holy Spirit move and recognise that presence in your life. Perhaps, as I say all this, some of you are thinking, well, I worship God with joy in my heart, but quietly, because I love worshipping God from safely amongst the congregation or safely inside my own home, but something like serving on our amazing worship team, trying to do sung or musical worship is definitely not in my repertoire. 
For me personally, joining the worship team would do the exact opposite of what I was just talking about because no one walking past the building would want to come in. They would want to run as fast as they could from the noise that I was making. Um, but this leads me to my final point, which is that I want to make on this topic. Something that I think is often forgotten when we talk about worship is that sung worship, incredibly important though it is, is not the only way to worship God. With that in mind, and to round off this morning, I'd like to briefly draw your attention to the final few verses of the chapter, which is 44 to 47. On that day, men were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes, to gather into them the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites, according to the fields of the towns, for Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. And they performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did the singers and the gatekeepers, according to the command of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there were directors of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And all Israel, in the days of Zerubbabel and the days of Nehemiah, gave the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, and they set apart that which was for the Levites, and the Levites set set apart that which was for the sons of Aaron. So in this final bit, we hear how others serve by providing for the city and the community, by providing and caring for the Levites who are providing this worship. They're taking care of the storerooms, the contributions, the tithes. For some, their worship the time they feel closest to God comes not from singing on a Sunday morning or in the shower or wherever else, but from serving others. Whether that's serving in our wider community through your job or through voluntary work or serving our church community like our amazing setup, refreshments, welcome teams, just to name a few. The things that people do day in and day out in our cafe, in our shop, the things people do week and week out on our teams, And if we serve our community with God in our hearts as a form of worship, then the same thing applies to this as applies to song worship. When we do it with thankfulness to God and joy and our hearts and minds turned to God as we do it, then the whole world around us gets a window into the brilliance of a life lived with God for God. So as you go out into the rest of this week, I want you to try two things. First, Begin to build a habit of taking a moment before your small groups, before your Bible study on your own, before church next Sunday, to pray, to sit in peace and invite the Holy Spirit in and ready your heart to worship God and hear his word. And second, however you choose to worship, whether it's sung worship, art, serving others, whatever it is, I ask you to be conscious of remembering why. Remember how absolutely incredible our God is and how joyful it is to recognize that through worship. And before we round up this morning, I'd like us to practice what I've been preaching. So in a moment, I'm going to invite our wonderful worship team to come back and join me at the front. I'm going to ask you to stand to sing another song of worship together. But first, let's take a few minutes to prepare our hearts and invite the Holy Spirit in and ready our hearts to joyfully worship God and raise him in praise and thanksgiving. So, dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for everything that you have done for us, both individually and as a people. We ask you to fill our hearts with joy and remind us today how joyful a life led by you can be. So Holy Spirit, come and fill this space and fall upon us all now. Prepare our hearts of everyone here today to be with you now. Holy Spirit, come. listening to how we um i just feel god uh, and I, I just feel the holy spirit just uh is just resting on us singing uh to sing about holy forever again 
and the words of this song, so powerful. It focuses on his name, his name being the highest and the greatest, and that it stands above all names. And I just pray today that like someone, I feel right now that someone doesn't know that, or someone has put something before God's name um, in front of their lives um, first, and I want us to just, um, either you, wherever, however you feel comfortable, either you stand or you um, sit, however you feel comfortable worshiping in this, this song. Um, yeah, let's just um, invite the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us. Holy Spirit, come. We are here when we're here and we're ready for you, Father. Yes,
service now. We're going to say goodbye to the live stream. Thank you so much for joining us.